Welcome to Profit Boss Radio, where successful women have paved the road to their own financial freedom. Each week, your host, Hillary Hendershot, financial coach, money mindset expert, and experienced wealth manager, will help you discover the keys to the wealth and peace of mind you want and deserve in her no-nonsense and authentic style. Starting right now. Hey, all. If you're new to the show, welcome to Profit Boss. I'm Hilary Hendershot, your host. I do three kinds of episodes here, all designed to bolster your knowledge, inspire you, educate you, and empower you. Sometimes I interview experts on topics related to wealth building, like negotiating, paying off debt, starting a side hustle, or how to understand what index funds are. Other times I interview women with really incredible money stories. They're often anonymous because they give you their real numbers, and those are called everyday heroine episodes. The third kind of episode I do is where I talk and I teach you things I know and I've learned over my 16 years in the investing and financial planning business. Today's episode is inspired by all of the guffawing I do when I listen to other people's financial podcasts. I like to keep the creative juices flowing. And of course, I have to make sure that I know what's happening out there. So I listen to a lot of podcasts. And I often find myself at home or in the car by myself going, what? I cannot believe he said that. Or yeah, you should totally do that if you want to be broke. So I started writing them down. And today I have for you the top 10 worst pieces of advice I've heard on other financial podcasts. Okay, I'm going to dig right in. Number 10, the bucket investing strategy. So if you've been listening to this show, you know that your behavior as an investor is the biggest thing that impacts your experience of investing. The stocks and investments are external to you, but your psychology, mindset, education, and the advice you're getting impact your behavior with those investments. When you buy in and out of investments, you lock in either gains or losses. Until then, you're really just on the roller coaster ride that is investing. And I know that metaphor of a roller coaster ride might not sound enticing. Like if I said to you, hey, why don't you date this one guy? It's going to be a real roller coaster ride. That's not a real selling point for dating that dude. But stocks go up and stocks go down. And it all happens so slowly over time that you get used to the way the current market feels. During the financial crisis, it felt like that was never going to end. But now look where we are. The financial news media is saying it's probably the end of a seven year bull market. And that's what I mean by roller coaster rides. So there's lots of talk out there about how to get investors to stay in the market, to disregard their normal emotional tendencies and stay invested when the market dips. So they don't like to miss, so they don't miss the eventual upswing. So I'm listening to this podcast and this guy says that people should have a bucket investing strategy. He's saying, no way, you don't need to pay a financial advisor. You can just use your own psychology to your advantage. Just build systems to trick yourself. You should just carve out a big enough piece of your nest egg, he didn't say how much, and set it aside in so-called safe investments. And then you're cool, right? You're good. If you look at that safe account and you see stability, you should be just fine with the rest of your nest egg going haywire. So you have a safe bucket and a growth bucket. And he actually said, then you can just go for it in the growth bucket, whatever that means, because you know you have a safe bucket. So I would describe this as the training wheels approach to investing. Like you need those training wheels to support you or like bowling with bumpers. You know, those long tubes they inflate in the gutters of the bowling alley. So kids will maybe knock some pins down. That's what this strategy is. So let's talk numbers. Let's say you have $200,000 in savings and you need 50,000 of that for your curveball account in cash. That's not for safety, by the way. That's for liquidity. And that means you can get to that money that day with no hassle in case you lose your job or have some like really terrible disaster. Because of inflation, as you know, cash goes down. The value of cash goes down over time. So cash is not safe. It's actually dangerous. Sidebar, but then let's say, so you take 50K out of your 200K and you're left with 150K and you want a safe bucket and a growth bucket. So how much of that money do you need to be safe? 
So if it's not enough, then it's not going to give you enough stability, right? And so I think it has to be about half. Like you're going to want to put about half. If you want an account that's really going to make you feel stable and solid, you carve out $75,000 of that one fifty, and you put it into a CD. CDs are earning about 1% right now. And then you take the other half of the money and you put it in a globally diversified portfolio of index mutual funds. So I'm going to use a growth rate of 8% because the S&P 500, for example, earned an annualized return of 8.19% over the 23-year period from 1992 to 2015. Note that that 8% average includes the horribly negative years of the financial crisis. So you know there must have been some fantastically positive years too, right? So what kind of returns can you expect from your safe buckets investing strategy after 20 years? Well, your safe bucket is worth just $91,514.25, while your go-for-it bucket is worth $349,571.79, which brings us to a grand total of $441,086.04. But what is the opportunity cost of this strategy? Opportunity cost is a very important concept that I talk about a lot on this show. And what it is, is basically, what could I have had in a parallel universe? If I hadn't chosen this strategy, what else would I have been doing with my time and money? So let's say you had never heard of this safe bucket investing strategy. So you hire a comprehensive behavioral financial advisor and you invest all of your hard earned dollars all $150,000. And this advisor charges 1% per year. And because she builds you a better portfolio, you still end up getting 8%. And you work closely with this advisor and you manage to hang on through the up markets and the down ones and you earn that 8% on your entire nest egg for 20 years. Well, now you have basically $700,000, $699,143.57. That's a difference of $258,057.53. And even if you only get 7% with this advisor, 7% net, you still have $580,452.67, which is almost $140,000 more than this guy's dumb strategy produced for you. That's your opportunity cost of the buckets strategy. That's the cost of needing training wheels on your investments. And it's another reason having a financial advisor on your team is likely to mean you'll end up with a far better financial experience overall. Number nine on the countdown is avoiding your company 401k plan. So I'm listening to this podcast and this guy says, uh, you probably shouldn't contribute to your 401k because the investment options in there are really bad. You should just put your money in an IRA and then in a brokerage account instead. He said, hey, forget about the tax deduction. You can make up the loss you'll take by paying taxes in excess earnings. Uh, wow. Not likely. (laughs) So the first thing he doesn't understand is that the 401k is simply one of the best places to save on taxes. The other is the mortgage interest deduction if you own your own home. But for those of you who work for employers that offer you a 401k, you can defer up to $18,000 of taxable income every year into a 401k. That's literally taking money away from the IRS and putting it in your nest egg. It's a pretty good deal. Yeah, sometimes the 401k investment options are pretty bad, but they have to be really, really bad to do what he's saying. Let's do a little math. And of course, I can't do a full treatment of this, but I'm going to assume that you have even the slightest bit of prowess at picking 401k investments. I mean, the Department of Labor requires that every single 401k has an index fund in it. Almost 99% of the time, it is an S&P 500 index. So while that is not investment advice and I'm not responsible for your 401k investment choices, that is something you can choose. Let's even be generous and say it's one of those really big, really expensive 401k plans. So you get the returns of the S&P, but the company takes 1%. So in scenario one, you max out your 401k at $18,000 per year for five years. Instead of earning 8% like you were before, now you're earning 7% because the company takes its 1%. And at the end of five years, you have $103,513.30. 
In scenario two, you follow this guy's advice and you put the max into an IRA, which is only 5,500, instead of 18,000 into your 401k. But you still have $12,500 that you don't want to put into your 401k. So you pay taxes on that at 25% combined tax rate and put the remainder, which is $9,375 into a brokerage account. And remember that these accounts are going to grow at 8% instead of 7, which is what this guy says is going to be your saving grace. So how much do you have now? Well, your IRA is worth just $32,266.31 after five years. Your brokerage account is $54,999.38, putting your opportunity cost of this avoid the 401k strategy at $16,247.60. So this guy just costs you 16 grand. Even the extra returns aren't enough to make up the difference from the huge tax hit you take at the beginning. Let's look at a scenario that's even more real world, though, because most employers have to offer some kind of matching in their 401k, and five years is really too short of a period of time to evaluate. So let's go to 20 years. So now your employer matches your contributions with an additional $3,000 per year, and you leave that employer after 10 years, which is frankly longer than most people work for a single employer. At that point, you roll your 401k into your IRA and it too starts to grow at 8%. How does that look? Now, when you leave your employer for 10 years, there's been $21,000 each year going into your 401k, the $18,000 you contributed and the $3,000 they're contributing on your behalf. And at the end of 10 years, your 401k is worth $331,455.59. You roll it into your IRA and it grows for 10 years with zero additional contributions at 8%. Now it's worth $715,587.75. But what if you took this guy's advice while you were working for that employer and contributed only to your regular IRA and then paid the income tax on the remainder to contribute to a brokerage account? Obviously, you're missing the employer contribution because if you don't contribute, that's the way a match matching contribution works. If you don't put money in, they don't put money in. Well, now at the end of 10 years, your two accounts are worth $215,487.61. And at the end of 20 years, they're worth $465,221.59, leaving you with a big fat opportunity cost to the tune of $250,366.16. Guys, that's you investing the same amount of money in two different ways. Mistakes compounded over time are a big freaking deal. A quarter million dollars, okay? That's a big deal. So that's the cost of bad advice. Why are you taking financial advice from non-financial professionals who don't even understand math? The impact of these things is huge. You take small mistakes and compound them over time, and now you've got huge ones. And some people never even realize that they've literally cost themselves hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, in mistakes over time from bad advice. Get good advice, please. Just at least promise me you'll work with someone who can do math. Don't take investment advice from someone who doesn't work for you and doesn't answer to you. (laughs) Okay, I promise the rest of this list will be less number dense. Okay, you guys have to tell me in the Profit Boss group on Facebook whether you like the numbers or if it's too much for audio. You just prefer the other stuff. Moving on, number eight in our countdown, the number eight item on the worst financial advice list is just put everything in a domestic index fund and an international index fund and you're good. I hear this advice all the time. And while it's not terrible or destructive advice, there's a lot of evidence that there are far better ways to invest. So here, I want to talk a little bit about, I think, the flawed thinking that people get into. People who are smart tend to relate to the people like them who are also smart. I mean, I see this as rampant, especially in the tech and engineering community. I mean, maybe I'm just overexposed to engineers because I live in Silicon Valley, but these guys and gals are smart when it comes to making technology. And also in their community is this conversation for they are the founders of companies that change the world, like Facebook. And then a small number of them get really, really 
really rich and these are their heroes. So there's a hubris, an ego, an overconfidence, and they want to use their thinking and their frameworks and their friends and their knowledge that's easily accessible to them to solve problems. I will give you an example. There is one really well-known person who hosts a podcast on marketing and technology. His platform is not about money, but he makes a lot of money. He actually publishes his income reports, so we all know how much money he makes. And he once decided to do a show about investing. And who did he bring on the show? Another marketing technology guy. And this marketing technology guy talked all about how he's taking all of his profits and he's investing in real estate and in dividend producing stocks. And the entire conversation lacked any of the terminology or evidence for it being a successful strategy that an investments professional would use. He had no history of returns, no annualized or internal rates of return, and his dividend stock theory is flawed. But there's nothing I can do. I'm literally listening to this podcast going, I cannot believe there are like 50,000 people listening to this right now. I mean, There are huge bodies of evidence around dividend producing stocks. The behavior patterns there are already known. And this guy's methodology isn't going to keep producing out returns for him. And by the way, the term out returns means higher than the indexes for very long, if it even already is. Like, I don't know. But the point is, this really well-known marketing technology guy reached out to another marketing technology guy to talk about investments. It's like an echo chamber people relate to the people around them like they're smart and they tend to rely on those people's advice to do things. Those people have no business giving them advice on. This is rampant in families too, like taking investment advice from your father, the doctor. Although recent evidence tells me that taking stock tips from your father if he's a congressman might be a really good idea, but that's a whole other show. (laughs) So someone I interviewed on this podcast, she said to me in the pre-interview chat as I was asking her about her investment, she said, oh, I'm just one of those people who believes you should just buy an S&P 500 index fund and an international index fund and you're good and that way you don't have to pay fees. My jaw sort of dropped, but she wasn't asking me for advice. So I don't say anything. I just said, well, oh, I got it. <laughs> so let's really look at what she said. The part where she said, I'm one of those people who believes. So belief has to do with faith. You need belief when there's no evidence, right? The most obvious kind of belief or faith is religion. You believe and have faith in the absence of hard evidence. If someone says to me, I never look at my investment accounts, I believe they're probably off track and going to struggle financially in the future at some point. I don't have evidence for that. I haven't seen their accounts. Maybe they've got 20 million and they don't need to look at their investment accounts because they've got a family office handling it. I mean, I don't know, but I do believe it. That's taking something on faith. So this person says to me, I believe you should just invest this way. And what she's saying is she hasn't checked it out because there is evidence about this kind of thinking. And I think these kinds of decision-making errors are rampant. She trusts all the people she knows over every investment professional out there. And it's a mistake and it's costing her money and she's doing pretty well. So it's probably costing her a lot of money, meaning she's putting a lot of money in her investments. Here's the thing. If you only invest in a domestic stock fund and an international stock fund, you miss the diversification of a real estate index fund. You miss the returns you get from an emerging markets index. And I just looked up one emerging markets index fund I know of and I actually use in client portfolios and it had an 84% return in 2009. So that's just for example. So you wouldn't want to miss out on that. I mean, I did pick a really high year. Like I'm not trying to say it makes 84% every year. It doesn't, but you want those kinds of returns when they exist. You would miss out on value stocks and small stocks whose indexes tend to have higher returns than growth and large stock indexes. So there's value to portfolio construction. There's value in owning all of these indexes put together in a professional way. And there's also value in recognizing that there are experts in every field and that it might behoove you to look outside your circle and be a little humble and recognize that if someone spends their lifetime doing something, they're probably going to know it better than you if you don't. All right. 
seventh worst piece of financial advice I've heard on a financial podcast. The seventh worst thing to do is let someone on your podcast who lies. <laughs> uh, so I'm listening to a particular podcast and this guy is a guest on the show and he says he's a founder of an investment company and he says that his solution has provided a 500% return since 2013 and that's twice the S&P 500. And right away, my BS monitor is screaming at me in my ear. I mean, it's possible that he's getting those kinds of returns. I'm not saying it's not possible, but if he's highly unlikely that he's going to keep getting those kinds of returns, he says he has an app and the app teaches people how to pick stocks using his model that's getting these crazy returns and it only takes three minutes per month. And now I know it's BS. Like I'm 100% sure. But I know that there are people out there who are willing to jump at this opportunity. I'm sure if he goes around claiming he's getting those kinds of returns for people and that it's cheap and it's easy and he's got, he must have people clamoring to get his app, right? So here's a framework I'm going to teach you to evaluate this kind of stuff. And you should just know that 99% of this kind of thing that you hear out there is BS. So first of all, think about all the money he could be making if he has a system that produces twice the returns of the S&P 500. He would literally be a billionaire just because everyone in the world would want to give them their money. But here he is on this podcast pushing a free app to people who probably have, I don't know, maybe five or $10,000 to invest? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Why would he be paying any attention to the little guy? Beyond that, why isn't he running a hedge fund? We talked about hedge funds in episode 55, so you know what those are. And if he knew what he was doing and he had a strategy that was successful, why would he be bothering with everyday ordinary customers? He wouldn't. He would start a hedge fund because if you have a strategy that makes even 1% more than the market, you don't have to double the market. But if you have a strategy that makes 1% more than the market every year, you're a billionaire hedge fund manager. So I don't have to download his app or waste a minute of my time evaluating this guy because I know he's full of it. And guess what? I went to his website today and his company is what? It's out of business. And I just heard that podcast in the last six weeks. So this guy's a shyster. Don't believe the hype, Profit Boss. There are so many lies out there. It's incredible. You have to be really skeptical about where you want to spend your time. I think you want to spend your time developing frameworks for quickly being able to dismiss things because there is so much out there happening and you don't want to waste your time considering them or worse, waste your money because you got duped. So I just taught you one of those frameworks. Number six on the countdown is discount life insurance. This product is actually being advertised on podcasts. The advertisement says you can get, I think, something like a 75% discount on life insurance. This strikes me as a very, very bad idea. Guys, this is how insurance works. Not health insurance, that's different. And it's really, really screwed up in the US, as I'm sure you know. But this is how other kinds of insurance work. So when you don't want to bear the cost of a particular bad outcome that might happen to you, like having a car accident, or in this case, dying before you expect to, you often have the opportunity to buy insurance that will compensate you or your loved ones if that bad thing does occur. Obviously, no young parent wants to die before their ripe old age. So the smart and responsible ones get life insurance. And lots of people buy life insurance and they pay their premiums, their insurance premiums into a pool of money. And since lots of people buy insurance, there's always a few in the pool that do have that bad thing happen to them. So the insurance company takes the pooled premiums and pays the few people who have the bad thing happen. And that's how insurance works. But insurance is highly, highly regulated and the prices the insurance companies charge have to be approved of by the state's insurance commissioner. And life insurance is a pretty basic product. The premiums are a function of expected lifespan and we're pretty good at knowing in a pool of people who are a particular age how many of them are going to die in any given year. So the prices for life insurance should be pretty uniform. And they are. Because guess what? What happens if you pay your premiums faithfully and then say 10 years or so down the line, you have a claim? In the case of life insurance, say you die and there's your husband devastated 
and your kids are crying and everybody needs that money. But what if the life insurance company was poorly managed and did a crap job with the pool of money? What if they can't afford your death benefit because they offered premiums at a 75% discount? Well, your family doesn't get it. And there's no safety net. The government isn't going to come in and fix it. And that has happened. Insurance companies go out of business. And when they do, people don't get their payments. It's hard. That's a devastating outcome. So you want to make sure that does not happen to you. So you want your insurance company to be flush with cash. You want them to be financially healthy. You want the pool of money to be there when people who have insurance need the money. So when a company comes along and says they have discount insurance. It's a big, big no-no. Just don't do it. Pay full price for 20-year term insurance. Buy it from a big, well-known company like Allstate or John Hancock or New York Life or Northwestern Mutual and be done with it. Don't get your investments there. Get your insurance there. In my opinion, there are a few things it's just not worth shopping discount and financial services and products are one of them. You don't want less value. You want more. Number five on our countdown is all the various ways to invest in startups. The specific one that I was listening to on a podcast is called WeFunder, but there's also Indiegogo, crowdfunding, Patreon, Kickstarter, you name it. They're all over the place before. They're all over the place now. I mean, (laughs) They sell you on this notion that if you get in on the ground floor of a company that hits it big, you'll hit it big as well. Lies, all lies, all lies. First of all, 99 out of 100 companies that get funded this way go out of business. That's a real number, guys. Even for the big venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road who funded Twitter, even for them, nine out of 10 portfolio companies don't make it. Like, go out of business. You think you've got better company picking skills than those guys? Probably not. The other thing is, even if they do make it big, the investors and the Wall Street guys and the lawyers who make the IPO or buyout happen have zero interest in paying a bunch of money to little guys who put in $1,000 at the beginning. Your investment gets completely watered down and you end up with almost nothing. Nobody ever got rich this way. So I just think you shouldn't do it. If you do it, take the money from your gambling budget, not from your investments. There's also this idea that we want to support entrepreneurs, like we want more women run companies. So if you want to support women, you should invest in their companies. You should give them your money. Yeah, cool. So I'm a woman entrepreneur and I want your money. And if you want to support women in business, send me money. My PayPal address is hillarym at gmail.com. That's H-I-L-A-R-Y-M like Mary at gmail.com because my last name used to be Martin. So go ahead and send me money because you're a good little feminist and you're doing your duty. I will even read your name and thank you profusely on the show. The fourth worst piece of advice I've heard on a financial podcast is the envelope system of budgeting. Now, if you know your financial gurus, you know that no podcaster made up the envelope system of budgeting. Somebody else did. But I hate it. I can't say enough bad things about this expectation that everyone manage a budget super closely, like you're supposed to break up your spending into categories. In this case, literally keep cash in an envelope. And like when you want to spend your money, you have to take it out of an envelope. Can you say, holy setup to get robbed, Batman? Like, I just don't understand it. If you've listened to the show, you probably know I'm a really big fan of automating your money. I'm not going to go into it a lot here, but we'll put a link in the show notes to a system, an alternate system of budgeting. I don't budget. I hate budgets. I haven't budgeted in years. I don't know how much I spend on gas versus mayonnaise. You know, I just really, I have no interest in that knowledge. I do know that I'm on track to achieve my financial goals and that's what matters. So if you're interested in the Profit Boss system of budgeting, we will put a link to that on in the show notes. The third worst piece of advice I've ever heard on a financial f- podcast is buy gold because you're afraid of inflation or because you just don't like the central bank. 
So the first thing is gold is not even an investment. It's speculation. Gold is not a company that produces a valuable product. It's not real estate where people live or do business. It's a rock. It's a pretty rock, but it's a rock. You can make it into jewelry, but it still doesn't produce value on its own without the jewelry maker. Gold isn't even guaranteed to protect you against inflation either. During the time period from 1979 to 1984, when we had 7.6% inflation per year in this country, gold only rose 4% per year. So in six years, your prices went up 45.6%, but your investment in gold only went up 24% pretty dismal. And what was your opportunity cost of investing in gold? What could you have gotten with your money over that time period if you had been invested in the S&P 500 index fund that I keep talking about? Well, over those six years, your money would have returned 94.47% outpacing inflation. Pretty amazing, right? So when someone tells you you should buy gold, always follow the money. They're obviously selling a gold buying strategy or a gold investment or a gold fund or something like that. For years and years and years and years, I've been listening to so-called pundits and gurus talk about how you should buy gold because there's a crisis coming. And you know what? If you had bought gold way back then, you'd have tanked your financial plan by now. So I, whenever I hear people talk about buying gold because of the coming inflation crisis, I switch the channel. I delete the episode. Okay, getting close here. Second worst piece of advice I've ever heard on a financial podcast. Okay, I lied. I didn't actually hear this on a podcast. It's house flipping seminars. Really any financial seminars. I get these flyers in my mailbox. Hold on, I'm going to read it to you. This one says, pre-market special invitation Peter Solaris and Dave Seymour, the stars of the A&E hit show Flipping Boston, send you these two free passes and participation is limited to the first 100 registrants. All attendees will receive a free MP3 player, a free behind the scenes DVD on how to evaluate properties in under 20 minutes. And the first 100 callers that attend can register to win a free Apple Watch three days only. Ugh, ugh. I hate this stuff. It so totally plays on people's ignorance and desire to be wealthy. It's really sad. I mean, it's not ignorance, more like naivete. It's really sad because, you know, you can start investing in the stock market with less than $1,000. If you're practicing investing in real estate, you're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're putting at stake with every single transaction. Use the same framework I taught you earlier today. Look for ways to discredit people and move on. Why are they teaching a model that is supposedly so profitable? Why are they doing this benevolent great thing for you? Why don't they just create a company that does this profitable thing they say they're teaching to make money? If house flipping is so consistently profitable, why are they teaching ways to compete with them? Obviously, because the seminar business is more profitable than the house flipping business. (laughs) Financial seminars do not teach people legitimate ways to make money. They take your money and they teach faulty systems. I don't care if you do get an Apple Watch. Spend the 400 bucks, buy yourself an Apple Watch and be done with it. Save yourself three days, save yourself a lifetime of financial hurt and throw the flyer away. All right. Number one, the very worst piece of advice I hear constantly this one on financial podcasts are any one of the many, many dozens of versions of siren songs telling you how to achieve high returns in the stock market. In other words, active investments. Anytime you hear a teacher or expert or investor talking about things like this, stock pricing, value stocks, PE ratios, when to buy, when to sell, and they're not going to call it active investing, but that's what they're teaching. That's what they're advocating. And if they tell you they have some better solution, that they're beating the market, you ask them to show you the money. In investing, there is such a thing as a history of returns. If you create a strategy and it can make money, you can 
prove it. And that's what my husband does in his meetings with investors. If you remember from episode 55, where we talked about what is a hedge fund, we were talking about how really big investors evaluate hedge funds and other investment opportunities, but they do it in a really technical way. It's called due diligence. And there are ways to demonstrate prowess, but most people don't know that. It's like small investors don't know that. So they just take things at face value, but you shouldn't. All of the evidence we have says that people do not consistently beat the market when the market is efficient, like the stock market is efficient over time. But the profit incentive is strong. Greed is powerful and money is mighty. I hear these cowboys telling me they can beat the market all the time. I get on the phone and on the line with people all the time who hold themselves out as investment experts. And they say to me, well, I'm not a passive investor because like passive is like boring, right? It's like, ugh, I've got a better strategy, blah, blah, blah. I make money on the squiggly line. And what they are saying to you, and if you do any Googling around, I want you to check up on me. I want you to go find evidence. Go research what I say. You will find that what I'm saying is evidenced by the smartest people in the finance world. And when these cowboys tell me, and it is always a man, is always a man, when they tell me that they are beating the market, what they are saying is that they are smarter than everyone on the planet. Because that is the truth. Because the smartest minds in finance have been hard at work at this question for decades. Think about it. Unlimited profits are available to you in the stock market. Unlimited profits. Do you think some smart people have tried to figure that out? Yeah, they have. I promise you. Some have made bets that paid off. Some made billions. But the vast majority of people never, ever will. And so what these people are saying to you implicitly is, I'm smarter than every one of those guys. I'm smarter than everyone on the planet right now. Listen to me when I say to you, they are saying to you that they are smarter than everyone on the planet. Nobel Prize winners, Warren Buffett, Harry Markowitz, Gene Fama. And when someone says to you that they have a market beating strategy in an efficient stock market, that's what they're saying. I know I've repeated myself several times. Do you think it's likely that they are that smart? It's not likely. It's possible. We agree it's possible. Yeah, it is. So, okay, you've got my ear. So show me, prove it. Show me your history of returns. And that is what you say to these people when you read on their websites or hear on the podcast that they have a strategy or that this is how you should be investing or that you should be evaluating the company fundamentals or watching where the resistance points are. It's all nonsense. There is a reason they won't show you a history of returns. It's because their strategy ultimately fails. And that's why this is the absolute worst advice I've heard and why it made it to this very special place on my list. I hope, Profit Boss, that you have enjoyed the 10 worst pieces of advice I've heard on financial podcasts. Have a fabulous day. Hey, Profit Boss. Yes, you. Lean in here. I've got something to tell you. Do you remember that movie Mean Girls with Lindsay, whatever her name is, and the fabulous Tina Fey? It was all about this group of in-girls, the plastics. And Lindsay Lohan plays the new girl who wants desperately to be part of the clique. You get the picture. Tina Fey was hilarious in that, by the way. Did you know she wrote it? Anyway, I want to tell you about another group on Facebook. It's nothing like the plastics. I mean, come on, we're not in high school anymore. And seriously, it's much cooler to lift each other up instead of tearing each other down, don't you think? Because as we all know, as women, it can be tough to know who to trust when it comes to getting real about money. That's why I'm so proud of all the courageous women in the Profit Boss Facebook group. It's kind of like hanging out with your best friends. You know, ladies who've earned the right to be called your friend because you're not afraid to show a little bit of vulnerability. It's like that. And by the way, we let the men join too. So if you want to be part of a group of wholehearted women and men who aren't afraid to grow and support each other, give us a visit and bring your friends. Just go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash profit boss and you'll immediately be redirected to a place where you can request admission, which we will give you willingly. I'll see you on the inside. Thank you for listening to Profit Boss Radio, where creating success on our own terms happens every day. You're not alone in your journey to a rich life, and that's why Hillary is here to add value in each and every episode. See you next time on the podcast for women and money.